Tonight, the alleged Iranian plot to assassinate a prominent Canadian. This is horrible. This is so despicable. Erwin Kotler, former justice minister, outspoken critic of Tehran, told he was in imminent danger. What we know about the threat and how it was foiled. Russia bombards Ukraine and warns the U.S. not to escalate the war. That will be a, a danger for the whole world. And it takes just seconds. It says upload photo to undress. To turn an innocent photo into a fake nude. It just feels icky to see my head on a naked body. It's not me. Ellen Morrow investigates why there's often little that can be done to stop. There was nothing I could do to prevent it. it just happened. From CBC News, this is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. There is shock on Parliament Hill tonight at news that former Justice Minister Erwin Kotler was the target of an assassination plot driven by Iran. Kotler has been a critic of the Tehran regime for years, but a warning from the RCMP came just last month. He says he was told the threat was imminent to be carried out in the next 48 hours. Well, it was foiled, according to Kotler, but as Olivia Stefanovic explains, in the aftermath came a wave of support and a string of questions. In calling out this moral evil. For years, human rights champion Erwin Kotler warned of Iran's attacks against political dissidents outside its borders. We're seeing not only transnational repression engineered by Iran, but transnational assassinations. Now, the 84-year-old says he himself was targeted. This is at a level of horrific that um, is unspeakable. Horrible. <laughs> Scary. As first reported by the Globe and Mail, the former justice minister says he was informed by the RCMP of an imminent threat against his life last month a plan by agents of Iran to kill him within 48 hours, an attempt ultimately foiled by police. When you have uh, something as respectable as Mr. Irwin that could be, you know, killed by a foreign country, I think it's a wake-up call for, uh, for everyone. In the House of Commons, MPs unanimously passed a Bloc Québécois motion condemning that alleged assassination plot. Any type of uh, threats uh, not going to be tolerated, and uh, I have the confidence in our police forces to be able to handle this. Kotler was not available for an interview, but told Radio Canada he remains under constant RCMP watch. He's had 24-7 protection since the Hamas-led October 7th attacks on Israel. Surprising because Erwin Cutler is a very prominent name. It's not surprising because it is consistent with past allegations uh, concerning Iran. This defense expert says the Canadian government needs to better protect all citizens from the dangers posed by foreign regimes. But for all of the Chinese Canadian, Iranian Canadian, Indian Canadian activists and human rights militants and so on who don't have the visibility of Mr. Kotler, there is a need to reach out to them uh, to better understand their needs, to better understand the threat level the Globe reports that the threat level faced by Kotler has been reduced. However, Kotler himself could not confirm that part of the report. It's also not known whether any suspects have been arrested or have fled the country. And, and Olivia, have you learned anything more about why Erwin Kotler may have been targeted? Well, Kotler has long advocated for Canada to list the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist entity, something the Canadian government finally did back in June. And Kotler is expected to address a House of Commons committee tomorrow about the very tactics that authoritarian states use to control their citizens and those outside their borders. Okay, we'll learn some more tomorrow. Olivia Stefanovic in Ottawa. Pressure is mounting tonight for Employment Minister Randy Boissonneau to resign. He's facing a growing number of questions about his business activity and shifting statements about his family's Indigenous history. As Kate McKenna shows us, the opposition says none of it is adding up. What's your response to Mr. Polyev's call for your resignation? Employment Minister Randy Boissonneau on the defence again. I don't know the person in today's article. I've never had anything to do with him. That article in the National Post says Boissonneau's former business shared a mailbox with someone detained in two major drug busts. 
This is the behavior of a low-life fraud, not a federal cabinet minister. Simple question, how does that guy still have his job? Mr. Speaker, despite the innuendo, here are the facts. I don't know the person in question. I never met that person in question. And Mr. Speaker, those are simply the facts. Fresh calls for resignation for a minister already in the hot seat. Following revelations, his former medical supplies company claimed to be Indigenous-owned when bidding on a federal contract. For him to say that in a company where he owns 50% of the business, that he didn't know that his business partner was making claims, false claims, about the uh, Indigenous identities of the business owners. This is not becoming of a parliamentarian. I want to say unequivocally that I apologize. Boissonneau apologized last week for contradicting statements about his family's Indigenous heritage. I'm amazed that this Randy Boissonneau scandal just continues to unfold. It's, it's like this slow-moving car wreck we're watching. Do you think Randy... Some colleagues defended Boissonneau. Uh, I was at Randy's uh, served capably as the Minister of Employment. He's my uh, seatmate in the House of Commons, and I think he's uh, an able guy, and I think he's going to continue to add value to Parliament. Others said it's up to him to clarify. I think Andy will, will explain, his, as he has already done that, he will explain his situation to whoever is interested in it. Well, but what about you, though? That's not really an endorsement. I think it's for Randy to, uh, to continue explaining the, the circumstances. I'm sure he will keep doing it in the right way. Boissonneau denies all allegations, saying his business partner worked alone when representing their company as Indigenous-owned. But the Conservatives plan to keep pushing this issue. And with the Prime Minister set to shuffle his cabinet before the next election, some are watching whether Boissonneau will keep his spot. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. Nine people are injured, including two critically, after a stolen BMW collided with the Toronto City bus. So police say it happened as the bus approached an intersection. The driver and four others were taken to hospital, among them a woman who was ejected from the bus. All of their injuries were minor, but two others in the car suffered life-threatening injuries. Investigators are searching for a third vehicle that failed to remain at the scene. And there's reaction from the Kremlin tonight to news U.S. President Joe Biden will now allow Ukraine to use American-made long-range missiles to carry out strikes deeper inside Russia. But Breyer Stewart begins with Ukrainians already in the line of fire. In the southern Ukrainian city of Odessa, rescue crews picked through the aftermath of a missile strike that killed at least 10. More still narrowly survived. I do not feel hatred anymore. What I feel is disgust, said this man whose apartment was destroyed in the attack. After being pummeled for 1,000 days, Ukraine now reportedly has the ability to hit back further into Russia with the U.S.-made Army tactical missile systems known as ATACMS. The weapons have a maximum range of 300 kilometers, meaning they could target more than a dozen airfields over the border. Ukraine has been pleading for permission to fire them deeper into Russia for more than a year, but the U.S. only granted it now. It's thought the decision came because of the thousands of North Korean troops who are said to be stationed in Russia's Kursk region, which is where this Ukrainian soldier was based. We've agreed not to identify him because of security concerns. The situation is not easy um, and we have big, big forces. He says the U.S. permission is better late than never. I cannot tell you more. What uh, we will see about uh, one month, few months, because it's war and uh, winter is coming. On the streets of Moscow, calls for vengeance and calm. I hope that we will be smart and our government will communicate and negotiate, says this woman. Of course we should strike back, says this man. Russian officials have accused the U.S. of recklessness. It means the involvement of NATO, and the involvement of NATO might mean a serious conflict that will be a, a danger for the whole world. But it's Ukraine that remains under attack. The country's president visited the frontline city of Pokrovsk, where troops are trying to hold back a Russian advance that continues to claw away at the southeast. It's not clear how many attackums Ukraine has, but there is more uncertainty. The decision was made by the outgoing Biden administration, and it could change when Donald Trump and his team takes power in two months. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London.
All right, next, let's bring in Paul Hunter with a perspective from Washington. So, Paul, uh, President Biden has just weeks now in the White House, but this is a really big move. Yeah, look, Joe Biden's always said he's got Ukraine's back, and this would demonstrate that, even if some have said it's too little too late, while others, including Russia, label it overly provocative. Matthew Miller at the U.S. State Department underlines all U.S. aid now approved for Ukraine will be, in his words, out the door by the time Biden leaves office. He was also asked about the value of allowing U.S. missiles to target inside Russia, especially with this being so late in the Biden presidency. Without confirming any of this as new policy, here's some of his answer. The American people elected Joe Biden to a four-year term, not to a term of three years and 10 months. And we will use every day of our term to pursue the foreign policy interests that we believe are on behalf, uh, that we believe are, are, are in the interests of the American people. If the, if the incoming administration wants to take a different view, that is, of course, their right to do so. So, Paul, we know Trump has said he could end the war in Ukraine, I think, within a day or within two weeks, but, but he hasn't exactly said how. Is there anything you can say with certainty about his plans? Some predict he'll use U.S. aid, including permission on how to utilize it, as a bargaining chip with Zelensky, that Trump would threaten to pull all U.S. aid unless Zelensky agrees to negotiate a way out of the war, which, to attract Vladimir Putin, would include Ukraine ceding land Russia has now taken. But the truth is, Adrian, we don't know Trump's plans, and we may not find out until his inauguration. All right. Paul Hunter in Washington. Thanks, Paul. Turning to the Middle East now, where there are fears tonight of a worsening humanitarian crisis in Gaza, members of the UN Security Council are calling for a surge in aid to fend off imminent famine. Chris Brown now on the desperation for food inside Gaza and what Israel has to say about it. Outside the only operating bakery in Gaza's Han Yunus, a city jammed with up to a million mouths to feed, a mob of hungry people wait up to eight hours each day for the chance to get pita bread. Sharuk Abu Amar said she arrived at 2 a.m. My daughter sleeps hungry. Shame on them, the Israelis, she says. Today I came for nothing, said Hala Awad. There's no flour. The whole market is basically sand. Over the weekend, others in the city chanted, no to death, we want flour, demanding Israel let in more trucks with food. The Israeli agency responsible for delivering food says there is no hunger crisis in Gaza. Kogat says there are hundreds of truckloads worth of aid waiting to be collected in Gaza, including 137 that came through Monday. Our assessment is that there is enough food coming into the Gaza Strip. But if there is an organization that would like to increase the amount of food, all they need to do is coordinate that together with us. The discrepancy between Israel's assertions and the scenes of distress is hard to reconcile. But aid groups say once inside Gaza, a lot of food doesn't get delivered because of terrible logistics and theft. Over the weekend, 97 trucks were reportedly looted, but it's not clear by whom. There is not enough food reaching people in Gaza. Aid worker Rachel Cummings, who's in central Gaza, says it's Israel's legal responsibility to protect the trucks. We're deeply concerned about the proportion of children that we're seeing uh, reaching the health centers with uh, signs of uh, being malnourished, both moderate and severe. Israel says it's working with aid groups to improve deliveries. But at the local hospital, the pediatric ward is full of badly undernourished children. He's very skinny, said Yusuf Abu Laman of her 10-year-old son. She says he needs fruit, vegetables and especially clean drinking water, but it's impossibly expensive to buy. I'm telling you, she says, we're in a famine. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. A major windstorm known as a bomb cyclone is brewing off the west coast of Vancouver Island tonight. Environment Canada is warning trees could come down, knocking out power. The storm is expected to impact the island and coastal B.C. While it is likely to remain offshore, Environment Canada says winds could peak tomorrow night into Wednesday morning and hit up to 100 kilometres per hour. And a major cleanup is underway in the northern Philippines after a deadly storm tore through over the weekend. 
Super Typhoon Man Yi is being blamed for at least eight deaths. It is the sixth major storm to hit the region in less than a month. And in Azerbaijan, pressure is building tonight at the United Nations Climate Conference to agree on a financial plan to help support lower-income countries hit hard by climate change. International climate correspondent Susan Ormiston is there. Administrative financial... Week two of the United Nations Climate Conference began with blunt words. Let's cut the theatrics and get down to real business. An apt critique of week one at COP29 echoed by others. This has been one of the worst first week of a COP in my 15 years of attending. The so-called finance COP is tasked with squeezing hundreds of billions of dollars out of the world's wealthiest countries to help developing nations adapt to climate change and move away from fossil fuels. We don't have any clarity on the amount of finance that developing countries will be provided and who is going to contribute to that pot. Part of the problem, with a new Trump administration on the way, he says U.S. leadership has been neutered. Many of the rich world wanting to hide behind Trump's administration, so not wanting to come forward on the delivery of the much-needed finance. COP29 comes in a year of savage storms, crippling drought and deadly floods. Yet oil and gas production is on the rise and so are emissions. Baku's towers of flame, as they're called, are homage to its oil and gas reserves and the host country, Azerbaijan, is under pressure. How many oil and gas deals have Azerbaijan done this year while leading these talks? He doesn't answer directly. The world is moving on the direction to uh, to, to increase the green uh, energy, green transition. There's still hope that we can land a transformational deal here. But Canadian Caroline Bruyette is ready for the fight. It is going to include long nights, um, but really we cannot afford to fail. COP itself is under scrutiny after a public critique by some former UN leaders and climate experts said the annual conference can no longer deliver change fast enough and should be overhauled. So a lot is riding on this week's outcome. Susan Ormiston, CBC News in Baku, Azerbaijan. A new recall tonight from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for organic carrots that have been tied to a deadly E. coli outbreak in the U.S. The whole and baby carrots were grown by Grimway Farms and available to buy between August and October 23rd. They were sold under several Canadian brands, including President's Choice and Compliments. U.S. officials already issued a recall in that country, urging people to throw the carrots out after dozens of people have become sick and one person died. Well, the massive gaming platform Roblox says it's taking action to make playing online safer. But we didn't invite you. <laughs> You're some rando that was sneaking Ooh. in. But does it go far enough to protect children? More young girls are joining sports and sticking with them longer. They want to be who they are and they see that now on TV. Just a little bit better. And a Canadian singer's royal surprise. He signed it warmest, sincerely, Charles R. At Forex, which was really lovely, you know? We're back in two. Here we go. The winner is Ann Michaels for Hell. There you go. The Giller Prize, Canada's richest literary honor, awarded tonight to Ann Michaels for her novel Held. The epic family story spans more than a century, exploring memory, love, and loss over four generations. Along with the usual bump in sales, the Giller comes with a check for $100,000. Every book bears witness. Every book its own form of resistance and assertion. I'm here tonight in solidarity with that purpose. Behind the glitter, there is controversy. Dozens of protesters gathered outside tonight's gala, demanding organizers cut ties with corporate sponsors, including Scotiabank, over investment in an Israeli defense contractor. Last year, protesters interrupted the award ceremony. There are big changes tonight to how parents can control what their kids do on the popular gaming platform Roblox. Nisha Patel now on new tools many say are long overdue.
Can he get you if you're... Every oh, day, yeah. tens of millions yeah. of kids oh, wait, use the gaming platform thing. Roblox to actually, play and chat online. But they could be talking to anyone. But we didn't invite you! <laughs> Lately, the negative headlines have been piling up, with accusations of pedophilia, grooming, and posing a risk to children. And there kind of aren't many restrictions. Like, it's very easy to get around them, it seems. In Kate Anderson's house, Roblox is on pause for her two young sons. She's concerned her kids could be targeted by players who aren't who they say they are. But it always gets a wee bit much, and it's just too hard to police on many levels. Now Roblox is making big changes, limiting direct messaging for users under the age of 13, unless a parent gives them approval through the platform. We have more visibility for parents into their children's friends list so they can get a sense of who their children are interacting with. The company says some of the updates will take effect immediately, others won't be rolled out until next year. Experts remain skeptical and say parents can go a step further. Even if a game or a platform has tools like this, uh, have kids, if possible, turn off the chat altogether and use a separate channel to communicate with their offline friends. Introducing Instagram teen accounts. Instagram has also been boosting protections, a few months ago launching teen accounts to address privacy concerns. This could give parents a false sense of security, assuming that because these new features are in place, they can now let their guard down and allow their kids to roam free on the platform. Nothing could be further from the truth. Still, Kate Anderson says the changes are a good start. It's always a battle between trying to protect them but also allowing them to live and have fun. And she might be willing to give Roblox another chance. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Halifax police have ruled the death of a young woman found inside a Walmart commercial oven is not suspicious. They've not revealed how 19-year-old Gersom Roncourt died, but say after reviewing video footage and conducting interviews, they do not believe anyone else was involved. The oven was found to be working properly and a stop work order on it and the bakery area have been list lifted. The store itself remains closed. Well, there's a growing concern that explicit images easily created by AI are being used to target women and young girls. Someone who I do not know has this picture of me where I really do look naked. That's a really disturbing image. But is there a remedy? It can be very challenging to find a legal path in Canada to stop that. We get tips on what you can do. Lean on your friends and family. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. That is Prince Harry dropping in on the students at the Seaforth Armory in Vancouver. He even had time for a game of sitting volleyball. Harry is in British Columbia ahead of the Invictus Winter Games, which will take place in Vancouver and Whistler in February. You should inside find a couple of tickets to the, to the opening ceremony. So congratulations, you're all invited to the opening ceremony. Hundreds of injured and sick military personnel from more than 20 countries are expected to compete at the Games which will be the first to include winter sports. Well, a growing number of girls are participating in sports in this country, according to a new report. And as Jamie Strachan explains, much of the credit is going to growth in women's pro leagues too. Remember to spread out, don't be so tired. As the weather cools, the game has moved inside for this girls' soccer team. For Bridget Byrne, it's one of many sports she enjoys. It's really fun to play sports because you can have good teammates and you can play and make new friends. Her coach agrees. I always want to create a safe environment where they can come out, try new things. I want to be that role model in their life like I had when I was growing up. A new report says 63% of girls 6 to 18 participate in organized sports, higher than ever and only slightly behind boys. And fewer are leaving sport as they get older. For the first time, we're seeing that the dropout rate between girls and boys is actually starting to close and look more comparable, which is a real positive sign, a uh, sign of progress. Participation begins to fall as girls get older, quitting because of a number of factors, 
including many girls thinking that sports are for boys. But that's changing. They want to be who they are and they see that now on TV. Olympian Marnie McBean says a new professional sports landscape is giving young girls something to shoot for. You watch the PWHL, it's a physical sport, it's amazing. Um, it, it, it doesn't have to be dumbed down to be girls sport. Take the shot, save the score! So the future I think is really exciting. I have days where I'm like super happy and my teammate might be struggling. Canadian basketball star Kia Nurse says it's important for young girls to know they can be feminine and sporty. We tend to not put ourselves in boxes and say you can only look one certain way. We try to give ourselves an opportunity to show that you can be your most authentic self because that's when you're going to play your best. <laughs> Young athletes are increasingly cutting through the noise and enjoying the game. Just like, you know what, I don't even care no more. It's my business. Well, how about you do your thing and I do my thing. It's what more and more young girls across the country are saying. <laughs> Jamie Strash in CBC News, Toronto. Now it's time to dig deeper into the story shaping our world. Tonight, the rising threat of a disturbing online trend. Deep fake porn images are getting easier to make and harder to fight. As AI technology develops exponentially, we break down what to do if it happens to you or a loved one. It's really important to document because sometimes they get taken down and then you lose that evidence. But first, how it works, how much is out there and what the law says. One young woman shares her story. There was nothing I could do to prevent it. It just happened. How an online photo became a sexually explicit image. Ellen Morrow spoke to her and her parents and shares a real life story with real life impact. It says upload photo to undress. Yep. I'm gonna use your work profile image. I'm about to be deep faked, and it's as unnerving as it sounds. I'm nervous okay. to see what this is gonna look like. This is one of countless sites easy to find online that uses artificial intelligence to nudify images. We're gonna uh, undress. Undress. Oh God. And then it says AI will help identify the clothing. The result, a fake image that I never took that looks real enough. Oh, that's so gross. It just feels icky to see my head on a naked body. It's not me. If I were just posting this on social media, I mean, it would convince a lot of people. At least 50 teenage girls have been caught up in a fake nude photo scandal. Yeah, a large number of online chat rooms have been found to be sharing sexually explicit deep fake images. Deep fake porn is on the rise. We've seen an explosion of what have become known as deep mm -hmm. fakes. AI generated AI. pornographic images. With more cases now in Canada too. A London high school has sent a notice to parents regarding students sharing AI generated images. Created for revenge, extortion, even just the satisfaction of the perpetrator. Anyone with a photo on the internet can be a target, with children often in the crosshairs. As these tools are made more available, as they become more sophisticated, we see that this problem is going to continue to be exasperated. And if it happens to you, there may not be much you can do about it. These were the messages that I got. You know, sounds like a teenager. 16-year-old Ruby in Toronto was targeted in a deep fake phishing scam. She received these messages telling her there were photos of her online, trying to get her to click on a link. And they're not gibberish messages, like it looks no. legit. I'm pretty good on social media about knowing when something sounds Sketchy and but when she refused, Ruby was sent an explicit deep fake. A once fully clothed photo she had posted on social media now showed her topless. It looks so real. Yeah, it looks very real. And We're not showing the image, the original photo taken when Ruby was just 13. How do you feel seeing them now? It just grosses me out. It yeah. always grosses me out. Someone who I do not know has this picture of me where I really do look naked. And whether or not that's true, that's a really disturbing image that someone has. What kind of emotions were going through your mind? I didn't do anything wrong. There was nothing I could do to prevent it. It just happened. Um, and then I was filled with a lot of anger. One of the worst things that could happen to you is that a nude picture of you is online because nothing 
nothing ever leaves the internet. And suddenly, I was in that worst case scenario. When we were talking it through... Ruby quickly told her parents, Daniel and yeah, Karen, no, who say they felt that. helpless. I think one of the most powerful things that, that she said is it, it just hurts that as a woman, my body is being weaponized against me. How did you feel hearing your daughter, your teenage daughter, say that to you? Uh, that, that hit hard because it's, it's not fair that somebody can take something and, and use her image against her. We didn't know how to help make her feel better and how to really know where this photo was and where, and where it was going. There's one main tip line for all of Canada to report sexually explicit deep faked images of young people. And it's here at the Canadian Centre for Child Protection in Winnipeg. They said last year they processed 4,000 of those images and it was their very first year tracking them. Right now we're going to be going into our cyber tip area. So this is Lindsay Lobb is the operations director of support services here. The sheer amount of complaints about images, deep faked or not, can be overwhelming. What's happening here is our analysts are receiving reports related to online child sexual exploitation from the public. They're processing those reports and triaging them to the appropriate police or child welfare service. Once images are reported here, their digital fingerprint can be flagged and added to the center's Project Arachnid technology. Project Arachnid crawls the internet 24 seven, scanning thousands of images a second and issuing- An effort to stop the spread of child sexual abuse material, but the rise of AI deepfakes is making it harder to keep up. How does this trend compare to trends you've seen in the past? because of the availability of these tools that are often even advertised or made available for free. This has continued to grow and evolve and, and continue to be a problem. Sexually explicit deepfakes of minors are considered child pornography under Canada's criminal code. But prosecuting those cases can prove impossible. There are so many deep fake tools online, and so often the perpetrators are unknown or outside of Canada. You've got timelines on IP addresses and how long internet service providers retain their IP addresses, getting the screenshots of the chat. It's definitely by far the most complex type of investigations that law enforcement has to deal with. Corporal Heather Bangle is with Alberta's Internet Child Exploitation Unit. She says most often young deepfake victims are being targeted for money. Whether the child sends an image or if they use deepfake, they use an intimate image and threaten to post that image and say it's them and ruin their life if they don't send them money. Do you remember your reaction when you realized we have this new problem that's fueled by technology? The technology is going to get better. We already have so many cases. I can't remember the exact moment, but I do know the more I learn about AI and deep fakes, I, I do remember feeling and saying that this is going to be a nightmare. The challenges can be harder still if an adult is targeted because there is no clear offense for that in the criminal code. For somebody who finds content like this online and is trying to figure out what to do, it can be really confusing. I think we are seeing... Toronto lawyer Molly Reynolds represents adult victims in civil cases. Say I were to learn that there was an image of me on a site where countless people could see it, what would I be able to do? Oftentimes the first route is to go through the takedown request to the particular platform. There may be civil law or criminal law routes um, to make a claim for harassment. However, if uh, a stranger just takes your image um, anywhere in the world and turns it into a deep fake, it can be very challenging to find a legal path in Canada to stop that. The government's online harms bill targets tech companies to force them to do more to remove sexually explicit deepfakes. But the bill is tied up in a precarious parliament. There's two tiers. Molly says there are faster, more effective solutions. For example, a discreet amendment to the criminal code to ensure that deepfakes are included in the criminal offense for non-consensual distribution of images. Instead of waiting on this very broad legislation that may be not passed for other reasons. 
All the while, the technology is rapidly improving, as I experienced firsthand. We're going to uh, undress. Oh, gosh, it's just not fun to see this. Yeah, again, this would have taken a couple hours in Photoshop in the good old days. Every year, we're going to see massive generational leaps in the realness of those images. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the White Hatter. Brandon Lohr is an online safety educator delivering workshops to schools across Canada. Let's pretend a hacker gets your password here. That education more in demand as schools start to see deepfake porn cases of their own. Students targeting other students. Is there anything that when you're talking to students, you say that they can do to protect themselves? The answer to the question, is there anything you can do to prevent this? Never post something on the internet, but not that's gonna not happen really for a teenager. A, that's not that's not gonna happen. But you really can't control what other people post about you. And once you press that send button, once you press that post button, you do lose some control. Salt. As far as Ruby knows, the deepfake of her was never posted publicly. The family's goal now, raising awareness for others. You know, this is not an easy thing to talk about. Why did you want to talk to us about it? The more people know about it, I think the more empathy people will have for victims, I think the better protected everyone is. What's still being taught around cybersecurity is that nothing ever leaves the internet, and to be safe, don't take nude photos. And that's true, but now it's an entirely other ball game. So Ellen, it's really interesting. I, I mean, watching you, I think I, I get a sense of what it must have felt like to, to see yourself being deep faked, but you didn't have to do that for this story. Why did you want to do that? Well, we wanted to find the most effective way of showing just how violating this can feel. Now, I obviously knew this was mm -hmm. happening. I was part of it. And you still see how grossed out I am watching it unfold. So how much worse would it be for someone who had no idea their image was being manipulated like this? And I know you reached out to some tech companies in the course of doing this. What did you hear from them? Well, we asked Google why these sites are so easy to find, as you see in the piece. And it said the sites are not illegal, that they're not inherently non-consensual, and that they don't actually host the images that are created. But it says it is working on ranking search results to try to limit their visibility, and that it does remove non-consensual explicit images from its search. All right, Ella Morrow, thank you. You're welcome. We're going to continue this conversation on explicit deep fakes. It's really important that uh, people aren't suffering alone. We get some advice on what you can do if you're a victim next. Tonight, we're breaking down the rise of AI generated deep fake porn images that can be created from your online photos. If that happens to you or a loved one, what can you do? Earlier, I spoke with Adam Dodge, a digital safety expert and founder of an organization that aims to end technology-based abuse. So Adam, if it turns out that someone has been the victim of deep fake porn, what are some things they should probably do right away? Well, number one, don't isolate yourself. Lean on your friends and family. There could be a lot of shame surrounding this type of abuse and it's really important that uh, people aren't suffering alone and that they seek help. Two, as hard as it can be, it's really important to document where these images and, and recordings have been posted because sometimes they get taken down and then you lose that evidence. And that's where you can use your support network to help you out with that. And then three, where possible, issue a takedown notice. You can ask mainstream platforms to take non-consensual intimate imagery down, whether it's generated by artificial intelligence or it's authentic. So those are three really uh, straightforward and powerful things somebody can do if somebody can, uh, some, some steps they can take if they've been targeted. So when you say ask platforms, are, are you saying that you can reach out to Google? Like, is, is there a form you fill out? Like, what do you do? Sure, so uh, with most platforms, even porn sites will take down non-consensual intimate imagery. So whether it's a mainstream social media channel or Reddit or a porn site, they actually will allow users to request that images that violate the terms and conditions or community guidelines of the site 
get them to take those down. And so they can follow that process for AI generated and authentic intimate images that were posted without consent. When it comes to Google, since Google's a search engine, what you can ask Google to do with AI generated images and videos is they can de-index those, uh, those websites where, or those web pages where those images have been posted from search. So if somebody tries to search a victim's name, that video or that web page or that URL isn't going to show up in search results. So that's something you can do. What, what's their track record on actually following through and taking these things off? I wish I had really a, a positive <laughs> response for you on this, but the reality is it's mixed. It's mm -hmm. mixed. Um, one positive thing that Google has announced re very recently that they are doing is they are going to proactively uh, remove these images and videos from search because there's no legitimate purpose to s for non-consensual AI generated images and videos like deep fakes to be showing up in search results. So worst case scenario, it's already happened, but, but for most people, I would imagine the concern is making sure it doesn't happen. Is, is there any solid advice in, in terms of prevention? So prevention is really difficult. There's no technical solution to prevent somebody from creating one of these photos or one of these videos because they are using non-explicit images. They can use your LinkedIn profile photo to create one of these videos. And that's it. So that makes it really difficult, if not impossible, to prevent. However, what we've seen is, especially with youth, they get their hands on these apps or go to these websites where you can create these images or videos, and they don't fully understand the damage that they are doing when they create this content, this non-consensual, explicit, AI-generated content. They don't realize that the person they're depicting has to live the rest of their life with that photo or video online because the internet is forever. So if we can be talking in our communities to youth and young folks and young adults about how damaging this is and that it's not funny, it's not harmless, it's a, an act of sexual violence, maybe we can change behavior and prevent people from creating these images because they'll understand the impact that, that they, these images do have on, on folks. One thing that occurs to me, you're in the United States, we're talking to you here from Canada, but this is a problem that is worldwide. Have you found any jurisdictions, any countries in the world that have a good idea legislatively, for example, for dealing with this? Sure, I think Australia, uh, they have a, a on, a, an online safety commissioner in their governmental office. Uh, they've been doing a lot of really promising work around this. And then the UK and their Online Safety Act is addressing this as well. So we're starting to see countries memorialize this as a, as a criminal offense and a deeply uh, damaging one. And that's the proof is in the pudding. We're seeing it in the, in the laws that they're creating. So that's, that's encouraging. Enforcing those laws is another matter, but mm -hmm. the first step is getting those laws created in the first place. Always takes a law a while to catch up with tech. Um, Adam Dodge, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate the insight. Thanks so much. Next, a Canadian musician gets a nod from the king. No, we gotta this place a little better. Some royal praise in our moment. So that is Canadian musician Jeffrey Straker at the piano there. He's pretty elated after one of his songs apparently caught the attention of King Charles. So Jeffrey wrote the song Better Than What We Found to mark the King's coronation last year. And we are now learning of the King's response. And so that makes our moment. Before the, the, the coronation of, of King Charles, I got um, a message asking if I would come and perform some songs at the celebration at Government House. They said, would you consider writing a song to help mark the occasion? So, wrote the tune. The Lieutenant Governor said that day, he said, you know, I really like this song. I'm going to Buckingham Palace. I'm going to tell the King about it. Some months later, I got this message saying, your CD has made its way into the royal household. And then I got this message. It just said, you know, I was moved by 
the song and move that the song was on this album. And he signed it. He signed it, Warmest Sincerely, Charles R. At, for Rex, which was really lovely, you know? He took the time to, you know, jot these lines down that, that made their way back to me. It was really, it was, I was moved by it, you know? It was really something. I don't know if you caught that there, but the song is basically about how it's incumbent on everyone to leave wherever you are better than the way you found it. Uh, and a shout out to the Lieutenant Governor. Jeffrey said he didn't think that the LG would, would follow through on the promise to take the song, but that is exactly what happened. From all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenal. Take care.